Amen. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Beautiful offertory today. It's always good, but I really like that one. So appreciate. Some of you don't know this, but I know they practice together a little bit on Sunday morning, but, but Charlotte comes usually on Thursday in here and, and practices. So just so you know, it doesn't just happen. And uh, I, I appreciate, appreciate them and what they add to our, to our time of worship. The same outline is in your bulletin that was, was in there last week. If you were here last week, you know that I, I bypassed it. And, uh, but we'll go back to it today. Been talking since the first of the year uh, on courage, or that subject anyway. And, and we will do that again today, return to that thought, courage or, or no, and the courage to say it. I, I know that I'm not asking for response to this, but I, I know that there are probably almost all of us in this room today wish that at, at some point in time in our life that we had have responded with the word no to a question that we responded yes. And we know that because we didn't respond no and we did respond yes, there were some consequences that came our way that, that we've had to deal with because we didn't say no. Now, it doesn't take a lot of courage normally to say yes. It doesn't take a lot of courage to go along with the flow. It doesn't take a lot of courage to do what everybody else is doing and act the way everybody else is, is acting, but it takes courage sometime to stand up for what you know to be true and to say no. Now, there are some, there are some cost to saying no, and we're going to see some of those in Scripture today as, as we look at this. So, well, what we're going to use for a text, it comes out of Acts. We went through this on Wednesday night probably over a year ago now, but, but, but as we get to this passage of Scripture, Peter and John, they have, as, as this chapter began to unfold, they, have, they, they, they were arrested. They had been preaching, and they healed a lame man. And, and it made the, the leader, the Jewish leaders, it, it didn't just upset them, and it didn't, have you ever heard the word peeved? I don't know exactly what peeved means, but I've heard people say, I'm peeved at you. And, uh, and, and I'm thinking that just means I'm a little bit upset. Well, they weren't peeved with Peter and John. They were infuriated by Peter and John and what they had done. In fact, they come to Peter and John and, and they said, and, and it wasn't a suggestion. It was a command. And the command was, is Peter and John no more. No more are you to preach and teach the name of Jesus. That was the command. But we're grateful today that Peter and John said no to that command. And they did continue to, to teach and to preach in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the, the three verses that we'll use for a text this morning begins in the fourth chapter, 18th verse. And it says, so they called them. This is the leaders calling Peter and John, and they commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge or you decide. And then in verse 20 it says, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and we have heard. This is the kind of courage that God is looking for in the lives of every one of us, his children. This is the kind of courage that he desires from us. The courage that will live in obedience to the commands of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, regardless or without any fear of what others will say or think about them. That's the kind of courage that our Lord desires from us. Now, I want to give you quickly, you can follow along on your outline there, I'm going to give you two biblical examples of courage. And the first one is, it, we, we go back in the, in, into the book of Genesis, if you want to read along, it'll be Genesis 39. And, and I'm going to read you about five verses from there. But it's, 
It's the story of Joseph. It's a part of, the, of his life story. And, 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 and in that passage of Scripture, the Bible just says this in Genesis 39, 6, Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. I just lost my place. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So it was as she spoke to Joseph, now listen to this, as she spoke to Joseph day by day that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. Now when Joseph, we know, we, we go back in the story Joseph's brothers are jealous of him. You remember this? They're jealous of him. And so they take him and they, they, they go out. Some of them want to kill him. They want to do away with him. But, but they wind up putting him, in a, putting him in, a, in a pit of some sort and, and, and he gets rescued. Anyway, he winds up being sold into slavery in, in the land of Egypt. And he was purchased by the master that is spoken of in those verses that we just read from Genesis 39. The master was Potiphar. Potiphar was a very wealthy man, and he purchased Joseph. And, and, and Joseph, as this, it happened several times throughout the course of his life, it doesn't, take, it doesn't take long for the cream to rise to the top. Well, everywhere Joseph winds up in his life, he quickly rises to the top. Well, in Potiphar's house, it's not long before he just goes in as the bottom of the totem pole, sort of a slave, I suppose, to where he's at the place where Potiphar puts him in charge of everything in his household. Well, being in that position, Potiphar has a wife, and Potiphar's wife is attracted to Joseph. In fact, she propositions him, and, and Scripture told us it happened. It didn't just happen one time or two times or three times or four, but Scripture says that he did not, or, or, or that she spoke to Joseph day by day. So if, if we can take that at face value, and I think that we can, then that means that almost every day that rolled around, Joseph was faced with the temptation of her wanting, and pardon this word from the pulpit, she wanted to seduce him. But praise God, he said, no. No. That's what he said. And, and, and listen, that the, the, the reason was not because what it would do to Potiphar, because Potiphar was just Joseph's earthly master, his earthly boss. But here, here's the deal. We kind of talked about this on Wednesday night, if you were with us. In verse number 9 of that thing, a part of Joseph's response in saying no was, how then could I do this great evil and sin against who? God! Against God. And, and that, was, that was Joseph's response. Listen, he, his refusal to yield to this temptation, did it mean that he was going to walk away scot-free? Nope. He was going to go to prison. Because Potiphar's wife, because, because Joseph said no, she accused him of doing something that he didn't do. So Joseph winds up in prison after being falsely accused and, and it doesn't take long because, because Joseph is following our Lord. And it doesn't take long before just as it happened at Potiphar's house and Joseph rose to the top, he gets thrown into prison. And through the leadership and the guidance and the direction and the providence of God, Joseph again rises to the top. And you know the rest of the story. He rises so far to the top that he is second to, to nobody except for the Pharaoh. And, and listen, he, he makes it there because it's a part of God's plan. But it all happened, and Joseph remained where he needed to be, all because he had the courage to say no. 
no. Now, let's just cut the corn. Sometimes it's hard to say no. Because, and, and we all have this. We all have a flesh side. And the flesh side tells us all these things. It'll be all right. It'll feel good. It'll, it, 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 it'll do this for you, it'll do that for you, and you'll get this pleasure out of it. But, but listen, it, it's never worth, for a child of God, it is never worth getting out of the plan and the will of God to say yes to something that God says no to. God used him because he said no. Then also in the Old Testament, flip over to the book of Daniel. In Daniel, the first chapter... Beginning with the eighth verse. And it says there, reading down through verse 16, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king, and notice that's all small case, who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. In other words, he says, he said, you could cause my head to get cut off, Daniel. If you go in here looking worse than, than, than the other. So Daniel, he, he responds. He said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for ten days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. So, so here's Daniel. And Daniel was taken into captivity with, with the best and the brightest of, 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 of his people. And he's taken into captivity in Babylon. And the king, it's a fellow by the name of O Nebuchadnezzar. The king, he ordered that, that he and his friends be given food from the king's table. Now, now most of us, we, we have expressions, something along these lines. It's eat, eating King's delicacies or, or things like this, eating, eating high on the hog. Well, Daniel's response to the opportunity to eat from the king's table, Daniel's response was no. And you say, well, why, why did that happen? Why did, why did he say no? Well, here's the reason. Because Daniel didn't want to defile himself with the food that had already been offered to idols. And, and so he asked the commander, the one who's the head over him under the chief of the eunuchs, he, says, he said, just bring us vegetables and waters. Well, the, and I, I brought note of it as we read it a while ago. The commander, he objected. And he said, listen to me. He said, he said you give me, try this for 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, you come and you examine us and you examine all of these others who are going to eat the food off the king's table. He said, you, you, he said, you, you, you kind of do, a, do an examination at the end of this allotted time. Well, th they do that. So for 10 days, it's water. I don't know what kind of vegetables they ate, but it was vegetables and water. I'd be rough on this old boy for 10 days, I'll just tell you. But that's what they did. And they had this water and these vegetables for this allotted time. And at the end of those 10 days, Daniel and his friends, they looked healthier and than all of the other youths. What happened? God honored Daniel's courageous choice and he protected him from defiling himself with the food from the king's table. 
Daniel said no. Well, when Daniel is much older, his faith grows, his faith in God grows, and somewhere in the proximity of as many as 50 to possibly 60 years later, Daniel is again faced with another challenge. And the challenge, this takes place, and I'm not going to read this to you because it's a lengthier text, but it's in Daniel 6, beginning with the fourth verse down through the 24th verse. Daniel has, he is, he is risen. He has, he has moved up to, a, to a, one of the highest uh, positions in the land. He's one of the highest officials. And the other commissioners, the other people who were along his same line, they were jealous of him. Jealousy is rampant in the Bible. Have you noticed that? Is rampant in the church today too. Well, they were jealous of him. And so they convinced the king to pass this edict, I guess you'd say, some sort of a thing, that, that, that anybody that, that made a petition, that would be a prayer, to any other god besides their little g gods, that, that, they, would, that they would be thrown into the lion's den. Well, here's Daniel. He's 70, 80 years old, possibly 60 or 70 years old anyway. And so he has to make a decision. He said, am I going to go by this edict that they have passed that says, I cannot pray to my God, and I have to pray to the little G gods of, of, of the Egyptian people, or am I going to do what I've always been doing? Well, you know what Daniel did? He said no to the edict. And he said yes to what he did. So Daniel continues to pray to the Lord three times a day. And sure enough, shortly thereafter, because he said no, and because he did the will of God, he was thrown into the lion's den. But did God leave him when he was thrown into the lion's den? Absolutely not, because the Scripture tells us that God shut the lion's mouth. I'm telling you this morning, it is still because the Scripture says that he is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And if God honors when his people say no to the temptations and all of those different things that come along in our life, if God honored those things then, God will honor those things today. I know we don't have a lot of them, but young people, God will honor you for saying no to sex before you're married. Young adults, God will honor you for staying true to your commitment to your husband or your wife for your lifetime. God will honor that. God always has and God always will. So there's two biblical examples of courage to say no. Well, let, let, me, let me show you some biblical examples of blowing it. Yielding to temptation. Well, we find the first one in the third chapter of the Bible. Genesis, the third chapter, beginning with, but beginning with the first verse of that passage of Scripture, and here's what it says. Now, now, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the, the, the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. Well, you know this story. The serpent said to the woman, you'll not die. For God knows that in the day that, that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Here we have the first instance in Scripture that I can find of somebody saying yes to temptation. Eve was first, and we could, we're, we're not here to debate who was first and whose fault was it. We know that one did and one followed. And what should have happened is, is they should have said no. 
e even had Eve agreed and seen that it was good to the eyes and, and good to eat, Adam should have said, uh-uh, we can't do that. Because God said we can't do that. But instead, they, they did that. And listen, not only did they pay the price, we're still paying the price today. We're, we're still paying the price for this faithful decision that was made because it was here that, that, that it brought a curse upon the earth and sin came into the human race. And we're still dealing with it. We have another example. David, David, in, in 2 Samuel, the 11th chapter, the Bible gives us this portion of the story. It happened in the spring of the year. At the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is, not, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. Now, you remember some things that the Bible tells us about David. He's a man after God's own heart. He becomes the greatest king that the nation of Israel ever has. But here he is at a place in his life where he is faced with a temptation. And instead of saying no, and we talked about this Wednesday night, but instead of saying no to this lust that showed its ugly head and reared its ugly head in his life, he didn't just commit adultery in his mind. He didn't just commit adultery with his eyes. He went all the way. And David committed adultery with Bathsheba, and David suffered some horrible consequences because of his sin. His family suffered consequences because of his sin. David, the, the infant son, we know that that child died. We know that another son, he tried to take the kingdom away. We know that one son tried to, tried to or did rape his daughter. And, 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 and listen, he lost his kingdom for a, for a short period of time. And, and, and I believe this morning that it was all because David did not say no. And it cost him. It cost him. Then there's Samson. And Samson, and we, we read this story over in the book of Judges, the beginning in the 16th chapter and beginning with the 15th verse. And you know this is Samson and Delilah. And how many of you have seen the show in Branson? Samson. A so few of you have. If you, ever, if you get up there, you need to go see it. But here's what it says beginning with verse 15. Then she said to him, How can you say that I love you when your heart is not with me? You've mocked me these three times and have not told me where your strength lies. And it came to pass that she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death, that he told her all his heart and said to her, No razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Verse 18 says, when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, come up, more, come up once more, for he has told me all his heart. So the lords of the Philistines came up to her and, and brought the, the money in their hand. And went, then she lulled him to sleep on her knees and called for a man and, and, had, and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and, and his strength left him. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and, and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he didn't know that the Lord had departed from him. Then the Philistines took him, put out his eyes, and brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with 
bronze fetters, and then he became a grinder in the prison. Listen, after Delilah repeatedly, repeatedly, and repeatedly, just like in the story of Joseph where Potiphar's wife came day by day by day, I believe that, I believe that Delilah came day by day by day, and she pleaded, and she cried, and she did all of those things, and she, she put on all the charms. And then finally one day, Samson... He didn't say no. He said yes. He said yes. He gave up the secret of his strength. And listen, he not only lost his strength, because that day when he got up and the Philistines were upon him, he thought in his mind, he said, I'm just going to get up like I have I don't know how many times before, but it could have been dozens, could have been hundreds of times before. And he said, I'll take care of them. But because he didn't say no, the tragedy is not his power left him, but the power of God had left him. And he lost his vision. He lost his power. And he becomes a grinder in the prison. I tell you those two things, two parts of this story to, to tell you. There is great benefit in saying no to the temptations of this world. And also to tell you there is a great price to pay for not saying no to the temptations and the things that come our way. Now, let, let me give you this and, this, and this is the balance of the message this morning. We're all tempted. It doesn't matter if we're Brother Palmer, soon to be a, Brother Palmer, you're soon to be 100 years old. April the 14th, I think, is the date. So it doesn't matter. That's good. I may mention that every Sunday, Brother Palmer. It's the only way I get an ovation. It doesn't matter if you're almost 100, or it doesn't matter if you're 8, 10, 12, or 20. Every one of us are faced with temptation. Now, the temptations, they, they, they may differ as we go along. You know, when we're, when we're young, we, we know that there's temptation to do certain things and to go along with your buddies and to go along with your friends. And then there's the temptation of, of, of sex before it's time for that to happen in our life. Then there's the temptation to do things in business. There's the temptation to cheat. There's the temptation to lie. There's the temptation to steal. So here's the deal, and it doesn't matter the temptation, but I'm going to give you, you can follow this on your outline, I'm going to give you three questions to ask when temptation comes. Three questions to ask when temptation comes. So before you say yes to a temptation that comes your way, ask yourself these three questions. Here's the first one. What is the source of the temptation? Or what is the source of the offer? Well, you keep this in mind. And you know that I believe that the Bible is the inspired and the infallible and the inerrant word of a holy God. And the Bible tells us this in James, the first chapter and the 13th verse. It says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. Let no man say, when tempted, I am tempted by God. And here's the rest of that verse. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself, God, tempt anyone by the same. So if whatever it is that we're tempted to do, if we're tempted to do something that's sinful, if we're tempted to do something that, that is evil, if we're tempted to do something that we know that the Word of God tells us and instructs us as the people of God to do, then we can know that that temptation is not coming from God. Because the Bible tells us and teaches us that he is not tempted by evil, nor does he tempt with evil. So any desire, any from the age of 10 to the age of 100 or wherever we may end up along the scale, any desire that veers from truth, any desire that veers from righteousness, any desire along any of those lines is from the devil. It's 
from the devil. Now, there's a battle going on. There's this flesh side that says, yeah, but everybody's doing it. There's this flesh side that says, yeah, it's going, but it's going to feel good. Yeah, but it, it, it's, going to, it's, going to, it's going to get you this in life, and it's going, to get, it's going to get all of these things for you in life. Listen, instead of being carried away by the pleasure or the benefits of the offer, we need to focus on the fact uh, that, that the Lord Jesus Christ has said no for us, and, and he doesn't want us to take part in that. But keep that in our mind. So, what is the source of the temptation or the offer? Here's the second question. What are the requirements? What are the requirements? What is it going to cost me? Listen, yielding to temptation, to evil temptation, to things that are, that are not for the people of God, it requires us to lay down our conviction. I hope you have some convictions. We talked about convictions here several months ago for several weeks. And I hope that you have some convictions. And I hope you, I hope you have some convictions that when the world looks at you and they, they see your life, that they think you're old-fashioned. I hope they think that you're out of date. I hope they think that you're out of step. Because when, when, when the world thinks of us that way, that means we're walking in a different direction than they're walking. And I'm telling you, it, it was that way in Jesus' day. But, but, but when we yield to temptation and we say yes to temptation, then we have to lay our convictions down. And we have to lay them aside. And listen, sin is always expensive. Sin is always expensive because it costs us. Sometimes it costs us our honesty. Sometimes it costs us our purity. Sometimes it costs us our integrity. But it's going to cost you something when you lay down your convictions for the things of God. Then you can ask yourself this third question. What are the consequences? What are the consequences of, of this particular act? When temptation comes, remember, we're all human, okay? And, and you, I don't know when you have to think back to, but when temptation comes, you're usually not worried about the past. You're usually not worried about the future. When temptation comes, you're usually worried about, how's it going to make me feel right now? You know, we've been able to go back to old David or to Eve or to Samson or dozens of others and said, hey, Eve walked up that tree and pulled off a piece of fruit. David sent for that good-looking young lady that was on the rooftop over across the way. Samson said yes to the, to the good-looking lady that, 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 was, that was there with him. But had we been able to, to hit pause, had, had their story just been on a, on a DVR, DVD, and we could have hit pause, and we could have inserted ourselves into, the, into that movie or that picture of their life and said, hey, here's what it's going to cost you, Eve and Adam. Here's what it's going to cost you, David. Here's what it's going to cost you, Samson. But they weren't worried about what it was going to cost them in the days to come. They were, they were thinking about how does it feel today? How does it, how does it make me feel right now? Well, well, listen to me. The satisfaction of the moment is never worth the pain and the guilt that follows by not saying no. So questions to ask when tempted. What's the source? What are the requirements? And what are the consequences? Now, let, let, let me give you these things real, real quickly. Why do people, why do we hesitate in saying no? Why do we? Well, one, fear of rejection. A fear of of rejection. If we don't follow along and we, do, we don't do what others want us to do, we may not be accepted. For young, for young people, it, we, we, we may lose some of our friends. 
for some of us that are not so young anymore and we're, we're wherever we are in this, in this course of our life. We, we, we have this fear of rejection. People around us, whether it be on the job, whether it be wh- wherever it may be, we, we just have this, this fear that people aren't going to accept us. So, but, but being rejected by somebody because of our convictions usually indicates something good in our life. Indicates something good in our life. You know, there's a, there, there's a, a, a gentleman. He's, he's passed away, now. I won't call his name. He, was, he, he lived in our community a number of years ago where I was pastor, and he, he worked at one of the local industries. And, uh, and, and he, was, he, he never pastored a church, he was a, a lay preacher. And he probably preached, uh, I know he's preached more. When I was very young in the ministry, we sat at Oakley Metcalf Funeral Home in the little waiting area where the preachers sit before service begins. And and he opened his Bible, and, and, and he was sitting there talking to me, and he says, he says, Brother Steve, he said, this is my 250th funeral that I've preached. And I got to thinking, and I've thought about him a lot over the course of my life. And he was a guy that just every day that he went up and he went to the local industry, and he'd done his job. And I'm sure that he was tempted, and I'm sure there were times that a lot of the men on a lot of those jobs, they probably laughed at him and sneered at him because, because he said no and because he tried to hold to the things that were true. But when, but when a lot of those men got to the end of their road and they didn't have anything spiritual in their life, you know who they turned and called back on? That man. That man. I'm telling you, I'm telling you this morning, it, it, it is not worth it is not worth keeping a, an earthly relationship. It is not worth keeping a, 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 a relationship with anybody to give up where we need to be with God. So, so, so don't, don't hesitate in saying no because you fear being rejected. Don't do so because you have a fear of, of, of a relationship. Now, this relationship, it, it, it could be losing a friend and, and, and listen, I admire young people. I admire young people, and, and listen, we, we kind of we laugh and scoff if a young man or a young woman makes it to 25 or 30 years old and they're not married. But I'm going to tell you something this morning. I'd rather see one 45 and not married than to see one 25 and divorced two or three times. I'm telling you this morning, don't, don't say, don't give in to temptation in, in, in the fear of, of losing a relationship. It, it would be better to never get married in life if that, if that was God's plan and to obey Him and remain obedient than, than, to, than to enter into a relationship that, that you don't need to be a part of. We also, we also, sometimes we hesitate saying no because loss of finance. Sometimes it's the conviction to, to, or, or the temptation to steal. Sometimes, and, and you say, well, I don't do that. Well, you know, so, sometimes, well, well, the Bible says this. It's not a, it's not a tithing message. But, but here's what the Bible says, and if you don't like this, you can take it up with me if you want to, but it's the Word of God, so do with it what you want to. A man who doesn't tithe is robbing God. You say, well, I'd never steal from anybody. If you don't tithe, you do. You sure do. It's what the Bible says. But here we are talking about the hesitation in saying no to temptation because of what we can lose. Listen, listen. Sometimes the temptation to steal or the temptation to cheat is fueled by the fear of losing money and not having enough. So we need to be careful. It's also the fear of, of the loss of an opportunity. Maybe it's one of these things that we think it's an opportunity that's, that's probably never going to, it may never come again. But listen, if the opportunity's not from God, you don't need it. You don't need it. Well, I think we've seen enough this morning to know that if it's not from God, it's going to bring some devastating results and some devastating things into your life. So, 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 so. Stand up there and be ready to say no. Also, the, the, the fear of the loss of our self-image. 
But everybody wants to feel good about themselves. Everybody, everybody wants to do those things. So sometimes we may be tempted to pursue things that the world says are good. We want fine clothes. We want fine cars. We want fine homes. We want fine jobs. And we do those things sometimes without considering what might be, or that we might be living in disobedience to God. Listen to me this morning. He knows what is best for us. I do believe that God is on his throne in heaven. And I do believe that Jesus, the Son of God, is seated at his right hand. But brethren, we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God who is the third person of the triune Godhead. And I'm telling you this morning that God desires and wants what is best for us. It may not seem like he does to us, but I've lived 50, almost 56 years, and I'm coming to the conclusion more so every day that he does know, and he directs our life in a way that he shows that, if we'll follow it. So let me finish with this. These are the reasons we hesitate in saying no. Where does the source of our courage to remain obedient come from? Preface it this way. It's hard to say no to sin. It's hard to say no to things that, that we know that we ought not do, but everybody's doing them and all of these kind of things. So where does the source of our courage come from? Here it is, the promise of God's Word. The promise of God's Word. Let me, let me read you this from Isaiah 41, beginning with verse 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Behold, all those who are incensed against you shall be ashamed and disgraced. They shall be as nothing, and those who strive with you shall perish. You shall seek them and not find them. Those who contended with you, those who, are, those who war against you shall be as nothing, as a non-existent thing. Listen to me this morning. We know that the Bible tells us that our Lord is not slack concerning how many of his promises? any of them. He is not slack concerning any promise. And I'm telling you, this is Old Testament. It comes from the, from the prophet of God, Isaiah, but he is delivering a promise to us from the Lord that he will help us. He will see us through. We can trust him. We can obey him, and he will help us to handle all of our circumstances. That's a promise. You say, but preacher, hey, there's no but preacher to it. There's no but preacher to it. The Scripture says that He is with us, and He will help us to handle all our consequences. So it's a promise from God. Here's the second one, prayer and meditation. Now, I'm not meditation. I'm not talking about sitting around, hmm, ah, hmm, ah. This is our, remember how Potiphar's wife came to Joseph day by day. Oh, Delilah come over to Samson. Samson, won't you tell me where your strength comes from? I believe she did that day by day. We live day by day, don't we? Today's Sunday. Lord tears is coming. Oh, Lord, don't tear is coming. Tomorrow's still going to be Monday. We may not be here to see it, but it'll be Monday as the calendar goes. Well, tomorrow's going to be Monday. And all the others are following. There's going to be a temptation. Tomorrow, probably going to be one today. And then the next day and the next day and the next day. Well, listen, our daily defense against all of these things that come our way is the reading of the Word of God and meditating upon it, thinking upon it. Listen, we, we, can, remember, we can remember everything else. We can remember if we're football fans, we can remember those statistics. If we're baseball fans, we can remember those statistics. If we're home and garden television people, we can remember how they do things on HGTV. 
Well, whatever we're a fan of, we have the capacity to remember and hang on to those things. Listen, as the children of God, one of the things that we need to be const- constantly uh, thinking on and dwelling on is the Word of God. You want to be able to say no when temptation comes your way, then have the Word of God on your heart and in your mind. And here's the last one. It's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. It's the third person of the Godhead. God, the Holy Spirit. He is the one. A lot of times we sit around and we say, I wish my, uh, when we're young, if we just in the general schedule of things, we lose our grandparents, lose our parents. You know how it plays out. So, well, I wish I had my grandpa here to ask him this question. Then we get that place. I wish I had my dad here, my mom here to ask this question. I'm telling you this morning, he, he, is the one who empowers us to resist temptation and to obey God. Good intentions don't do it. Good advice doesn't do it. If we're going to be obedient and if we're going to overcome these these times of temptation and these times of of decision-making that we've got to do, listen, we have got to depend on the Holy Spirit of God. He will not lead us wrong. He will not lead us amiss. He will lead us right. He will help us. He will empower us to say no when no needs to be said. I started out this morning with this, and I'll I'll finish with the same. There are many in this room, probably all of us, that wish we could go back in our life and say no to something we said yes to. We can't go back. But brethren, we can begin where we are today. And through the leadership and the help and the empowerment and the strength of God, we can learn to say no, and He will give us the courage and the strength to do so in our life, regardless of the temptation. Let's pray. Father, thank You. Thank You for the opportunity to be in this place today, and thank You for making Your Word so applicable to us. To know that many of these great characters of the Bible, they struggled with some of the same things that we struggle with. And that is to be able to say no to some of the temptations that arise in our life. Lord, we can't do anything about the past except bring it to the foot of the cross and ask your forgiveness. But, But Lord, we can begin today. We can begin today. saying no to the things that we need to say no to. Give us the courage. Give us the strength. Give us the wisdom to say no to the things that would dishonor you, that would harm our testimony, and would bring bad light upon anything to do with you. You know where each of us in this room this morning. You know exactly where we are. You know the points and the places of our struggles. And you know what we struggle with in our life in saying no to. So Lord, gird us up right there and help us and strengthen us and give us the courage to follow you and your way in our life. May you be honored by any decision that's made in this invitation. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing.